We will now hear argument in the uh, case of City against Cheryl, New York, against the Oneida Indian Nation of, uh, of New York. Mr. Sachs, whenever you're ready. Justice Stevens, and may it please the Court. With the Court's permission, the State of New York, as amicus, will address issues related to the Treaty of Buffalo Creek. And I will address the other reasons why Aboriginal title and other Indian possessory rights to the properties at issue were extinguished long before the Oneida Indian Nation purchased the properties in 1997 and 1998. The asserted basis for tax immunity in this case appears at page one of Respondent's Brief, which is that the Oneidas have, at all times, held a tribal possessory right in the properties. But even if there was a tribal possessory right, Aboriginal title, or under the Treaty of Canandaigua, in 1805 and 1807, when these properties passed out of tribal hands, the passage of 190 years has extinguished that right. For 190 years, these properties have been in private, non-Indian hands, have been freely alienable, have been transferred to innumerable innocent purchasers, and have been subject to the full panoply of state and local laws, including taxation. Well, is your provision, uh, your position that whenever uh, an Indian transfers land in violation of the Non-Intercourse Act, that that's a valid transfer? And if no. not, why is this different? The, it is not our position that, that that would be a valid transfer if there was a violation of the Non-Intercourse Act. Um, the principal issue here is whether, after the passage of 190 years, there remains a possessory right. If there was a violation of the Non-Intercourse Act in 1805 and 1807, Justice Kennedy, we believe the Oneida Indian Nation has a, under this Court's decision in Oneida II, a federal common law damage suit against New York State or against the United States of America for failing to exercise its fiduciary duty. But after 190 years, in 1997, they did not have a possessory right to these properties. The possessory right we're talking about, aboriginal title or some other tribal possessory right, isn't just a concept. As this Court has defined aboriginal title or those possessory rights, it's a right to current possession. And under this Court's decisions in cases such as Felix versus Patrick and Yankton Sioux and Williams and Mitchell and Santa Fe, um, all of which were cited in the dissent written by Justice Stevens for the four members of dissent in Oneida II, tribal, tribal possessory rights are barred by that passage of time, the change in the character of the land, and the innumerable innocent purchasers. Why, so, why does not having a possessory right uh, mean that the city could tax them for the state? The, the basis for the tax immunity here is that this land does not have Indian country status. For this land to have Indian country status, it has to be, in our view, under this Court's Venetide decision, federal set-aside and federal superintendents. If you look at how the Oneida Indian Nation got this land in 1997, it wasn't because of any set-aside by the federal government in 1794, even if there was, and, and I will get to that no, later. I'm just thinking, that suppose you have a reservation, but the tribe doesn't have a possessory right because in the middle of the reservation there's some kind of long-term <laughs> lease or a sale to a house that's owned by somebody else uh, who's not a member of the tribe. I, I would think, am I right, that the, the city or the county in which that reservation sits can't tax it anyway? I, I absolutely agree with you. All right. So if you were to say the tribe does not have a possessory right, they can't go in and eject all the people who are uh, living there and built houses over the last 192 years, that doesn't mean still that that you could tax them. But your hypothetical, Your Honor, presupposed the existence of the reservation and presupposed a possessory right subject to lease. The possessory right here did not exist because the Oneida Indian Nation had no rights with respect to the land at all in 1997. Those rights could not be enforced. Um, and for the right not to well, be able they to couldn't be enforced against certain innocent purchases. But when the land is, <clears throat> is reacquired, then it seems to me we have to ask whether there was an extinction of aboriginal title and whether the reservation was at some point subsequently disestablished by by federal act. And if we hold against you on the ground that there was no extinction of aboriginal title 
and there was no disestablishment of the reservation, then it seems to me that when they reacquire, we get to exactly the point that Justice Breyer raises, and that is once they reacquire the land, why does it become taxable? Why does it why does its non taxable status uh, not not simply reassert itself? I, I, th- I think that you have to look at the definition of, injury, of Indian country. If you look at the definition of Indian country, it requires, with respect to the properties we're talking about, federal set-aside and federal superintendent. So you're saying that if the, if the original establishment of the reservation was simply a continuation, was literally a reservation from a transfer of, of land to the state of New York, and that the Indian title was a, a purely aboriginal title, not a title conferred by a federal <coughs> act creating the reservation, that it cannot be Indian country. Is that correct? If, if I understand the question that you ask, Your Honor, um, if, the, if the title came from the state of New York, for example, in the — Let's assume the title is aboriginal. Nothing in an act of the United States says, we're giving this land to the Indians, e.g., in the Kansas situation. It's simply aboriginal title, and it was never extinguished. Are you saying that if that is the source of the title, as opposed to a federal act saying, we give this to you, that it cannot be Indian country? No, Your Honor. Okay. In 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 a situation where there was continuing aboriginal title, um, similar to the Senecas in the state of New York, where New York State did not terminate the aboriginal rights of the Senecas, there need not be congressional act, there need not be congressional or treaty action to establish the reservation. So this part of your argument depends on our accepting your position on the Treaty of Fort Schuyler as as being a conveyance of all property uh, and and a later retrocession. Is that correct? No, Your Honor. Because otherwise, otherwise I don't see what extinguished the aboriginal title. What, ex- what extinguished the aboriginal title with respect to this aspect of the argument, and then I will move on to the Treaty of Fort Schuyler and the Treaty of Canandaigua. What extinguished the aboriginal title is the passage of time and the fact that this land has been under state and local jurisdiction for 190 years. And this, this Court observed in Hagen and Rosebud Sioux, and I, I acknowledge it was in a different con- context, but this is important, that stable rules of jurisdiction and sovereignty are important in situations like this where what we're dealing with is very few, 1% of the, of the land in the city of Sherrill is owned by the tribe. The land is predominantly non-Indian. And as this court observed in Hagen and Rosebud Sioux, a finding that the land now comes back into tribal jurisdiction, to paraphrase, seriously disrupts the justifiable ex- expectations of the community, and that's not just a hypothetical in this case. No, it, I know that, but I mean, then it seems to me if one thing that United Two establishes is that the whole title doesn't just disappear if nothing else happens, simply because of the passage of time. I think what disappears, Your Honor, is what? is the right to possess. Oh, we agree with that. I I'll hypothetically agree with that. They can't come in and eject people. But then I'm back to my first question, because I take it that the refusal in Oneida II, the suggestion that they can't go, say, to Buffalo, New York, or wherever, or some town, and throw everybody out of the house, that that, of course, does reflect the passage of time. But... For a city or state to tax the land, that doesn't involve the same kind of interference with people's expectation of living in the houses that they bought that throwing someone out of his house would involve. Here's what impacts the the expectations. What impacts the expectations is the following. I'll give you an example that that appears from the joint appendix on the Court of Appeals from pages 1263 to 1277. In the year 2000, the city of Oneida cited two Oneida Indian Nation businesses, a convenience store and a gas station, for 16 fire code violations. The the tribe, citing this court's decision in Brendale, said, we're not governed by the local fire code. We're governed by tribal jurisdiction. It's more than just the interference, the, the issue of taxation, the issue of sovereignty, is whether a gas station is going to blow up and burn down. It's a matter, is it not, of whether the tribe now has sovereignty 
over this parcel of land? Is that what's at bottom the question? I think in terms of the problems for the citizens of the city of Sherrill, taxation is part of it and sovereignty is part no, of it, and they go if, hand in hand. If the tribe has sovereign sovereignty status with regard to this property, then presumably the city can't tax it. So we have to decide that, do we? Yes, you do, Your Honor. All right. Now, what do we do with the Oneida II case decided in 1985? This, the position we are taking here is fully consistent with Oneida II. In Oneida II, this Court held that there was a violation of federal common law, principally because of a violation of the Non-Intercourse, Indian Trade and Intercourse Act in 1795. Um, this Court wasn't asked to deal with, at that time, with the Treaty of Fort Schuyler. It wasn't asked to deal with the Treaty of Buffalo Creek. It wasn't presented with evidence of the numerous authorized New York State treaties in 1840 through 1846 that diminished this reservation that the State of New York will deal with, with it as Why a not? Why not? Why not? I mean, is every, every decision we make uh, up for review uh, when, when the interested parties uh, fail to cite the uh, uh, what, what they now uh, assert are, are, are the dispositive acts? No, Your Honor. I think that, that principles of stare decisis still govern, and I think what, and this is consistent with the position that we have taken um, with respect to uh, the passage of time um, extinguishing the possessory right, is what was what this Court, for stare decisis purposes, found in Oneida II was that there was a violation of federal common law with respect to a transfer that was very different than this transfer without any examination of the Treaty of Buffalo Creek and without any examination of the Treaty but, of Fort But Scotland. there wouldn't have been a violation of federal law on, uh, if this were not uh, Indian country, if this were not an Oneida, an Oneida reservation when the transfer occurred. Your Honor, that's not, that, that, that might or might not be correct depending on how one views the scope of the Non-Intercourse Act. But if one views the scope of the Non-Intercourse Act to, to apply — to Indian reservations, even state reservations, as the Second Circuit in the Mohegan tribe has held, then the Treaty of Fort Schuyler could have terminated all Aboriginal title. The Treaty of Fort Schuyler could have established a state reservation for the Oneidas, and the Non-Intercourse Act in 1790, two years later, could have prohibited the sale of those lands, even though it was a state reservation and under state jurisdiction. Is that the application of the Non-Intercourse Act? I assume it applied only to federal rep only to federal red reservation. Well, this Court has not dealt with that issue, and, for, and for, from our purposes — How does it read? What does it say? The Non-Intercourse Act — and if — Well, you, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The, the Non-Intercourse Act, in effect at the time, prohibited the purchase — made — prohibited the purchase of lands — from Indians or Indian tribes, to paraphrase. And that would have been and, — and, and what hasn't been put — Unless made by treaty or convention yes, um, entered into yes, unless, pursuant to the Constitution. Unless, un, unless, unless subject to federal approval. An idea of precisely what's at stake, because in the Oneida litigation, as I understand it, the counties and the municipalities, the city of Sherrill, would not be left in the end — Having to pay, New York would. The city of Sherrill is not a party in the land claim litigation. The land claim litigation. Well, the, from the county's point of view, I'm asking who pays at the end of the line, and it seems in the Oneida cases it's the state. Is it different here? And what taxes are we talking about precisely? What we are talking about, the, to answer your, the, the first portion of your question, Justice Ginsburg, I think ultimately the citizens of the State of New York pay, but it is the judgment would be against either the State of New York or against the counties in the land claim. In this case — What, what goes with the taxes? You, you've said that the other, the other effect will be that whenever uh, the Oneidas buy a piece of property <clears throat> that is within this former reservation and of which only 1 percent is now owned by Indians — Whenever they buy a piece of property, that property is taken off the tax rolls. Correct, Your Honor. Which, of course, makes it a lot easier for them to buy it because uh, it, it, uh, it's much less expensive uh, for them to hold that land. What else happens? The, uh, what else happens is that the town can't regulate. The town can't regulate it. And if they are running a business on it, 
Um, and we believe this is contrary to state law, but they're running a business on it. They are not collecting uh, sales taxes. And I assume it also means that that land can, cannot be repurchased by non-Indians. Uh, the tribe has changed its position on that, I believe, in the course of the last 30 years, but that is their current position, mm-hmm. that it becomes subject to the Non-Intercourse Act consistent with their position. With the Court's permission, I, want to do, I do want to turn to the 1788 Treaty of Fort Schuyler and, time permitting, the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua. Our position on the Treaty of Fort Schuyler, I think, is very plain in our papers, and I just want to highlight what's in the rest of the treaty after Article I, which is a cession of all land. What's in the rest of the treaty is that New York reserved numerous rights, even with respect to the reservation's land. New York had, among other things, the right to make and apply laws to the reservation to enforce the treaty, and I'm quoting from Article 4, in such manner as the state shall deem proper. New York had the right to enforce its criminal laws with respect to intruders on the reservation that New York granted to the Oneidas, obtaining the assistance of the Oneidas to do so. New New York in the treaty prohibited the Oneidas from selling the lands. New York in the treaty prohibited the Oneidas from certain length of leases, and New York had the right to enact laws with respect to the leases that were permitted to enforce the leases. The other thing that one needs to look at in the context of the times, when looking at how would the Oneidas have understood this, The tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy knew how to preserve their aboriginal title when they wanted to do so, and the Oneidas didn't do that. In the 1797 Big Tree Agreement with the Senecas, which is published at 7 Statutes at Large 601, the Senecas sold much of their lands to Robert Morris under the approval of the United States. In the agreement, the agreement provided that the reserved lands were, and I quote, clearly and fully understood to remain the property of the Senecas in as full and ample manner as if these presents had not been executed. That is the way an Indian tribe understood preserving aboriginal title. That didn't happen in the Treaty of Fort Schuyler. The other thing that happened — Or a good lawyer that they hired, and and the Oneidas may not have had as good a lawyer. I I don't think this was done around the campfire, do you? I'm sure it was not, Your Honor. The other thing that one has to look at at the time is what New York State was doing. New York State entered into three similar treaties at the time, one with the Oneidas, one with the Cayuga, and one with the Onondaga. Those three treaties all terminated aboriginal title in the first provision. The other three tribes of the Iroquois were not of concern. You say it terminated the title. You mean by the conveyance of all lands? Yes. They had the the exact same language in Article I. The structure of the treaties were identical. The other three tribes of the Iroquois were not of concern to New York State in 1788 because the Mohawks had mostly removed to Canada, the Tuscaroras had no land of their own, and the Senecas were in the portion of New York State where Massachusetts had the preemption right. So if you look at what is happening back in 1788 and early 1789, New York State is setting up a state treaty with the Oneidas and keeping jurisdiction over those lands. Now, to, to go back to what you asked earlier, just, Justice Scalia, no question that if in that context the federal government then passes a statute that says, as it may, you can, the Oneidas can't sell this land without federal approval, that's a violation of the Non-Intercourse Act, but it doesn't change the fundamental nature of the land as being under state jurisdiction and has been under state jurisdiction since 1788. Was there ever any federal superintendents of the land? The, it's, if, if you count an agent going on the land, there was an agent on the land. But what has happened with this land in terms of federal superintendents is that this land has been superintended and supervised, whether in tribal hands or otherwise, by the State of New York and local governments since 1788. There is a reference in our papers to a report that was issued in connection with the New York State setting up their troopers um, to cover the reservations. And that report acknowledged that the United States government appreciated the fact that the State of New York had been keeping peace on the reservations with their police and saw no reason to interfere with over a 100 years, and this was in the early 20th century, of over a 100 years of state police supervision. 
It isn't the FBI that keeps peace on, on other reservations, is it? Isn't it quite standard for, for state law enforcement to function? I'm sorry, I see my light is. Yes, go ahead and answer the question. The level of — yes, Your Honor, it is. The FBI doesn't do it. States often do it. They do it sometimes with the permission. But this happened for 200 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Ms. Halligan. Justice Stevens, and may it please the Court, the State of New York was granted time to address the third question presented regarding the 1838 Treaty which we believe requires reversal of the decision below because it disestablishes the Oneida Reservation. Respondents claim that they can now exercise sovereignty over any plot of land they buy within a vast 300,000-acre tract in central New York that's long been inhabited almost Is entirely. Is sovereignty something that the tribe can lose by inaction over a period of time? I believe that, that it is, Your Honor, for the reasons that are laid out in, in Petitioner's brief. But regardless of what the Court decides about that question, the Treaty of 1838 clearly disestablishes the reservation, which terminates all sovereignty prospectively. The language in the historical context — Yes, Your Honor. Treaty? Yes, the Treaty of, of Buffalo Creek. It makes clear, both the language of the treaty itself as well as its historical context, that it was intended to terminate Oneida sovereignty in New York State. Even if Rand — What what you seem to be asking is to infer from that treaty that the prior unlawful land sales of the Oneida's New York reservation were somehow ratified. No, Your Honor, ratification is not presented squarely in this case. The only question that's at issue in this case is whether or not, regardless of whether the transactions that took place between 1795 and 1838 were legal or illegal, and we've argued that they're legal in other cases. But if you're right about Buffalo Creek, it would mean that the effect of the government's decision to repossess something in Kansas was to leave the Oneidas without any land. Well, at that point, the Oneidas — It certainly wasn't that clear from it. It it was — it appeared to be the assumption that the Oneidas did not have to go to Kansas if they chose not to do it. It was dependent on making suitable arrangements. With regard to the 5,000 acres that they occupied as of 1838, one could read Ransom Gillette's assurances to the Oneidas as allowing them to continue to retain occupancy over that narrow slice of land. But what that cannot do is change the language of the treaty, which makes clear that the reservation is otherwise entirely disestablished. And if I can refer to some of the the language of the treaty itself, first of all, the treaty explicitly states that its purpose was to carry out the government's policy in removing the Indians from the east to the west of the Mississippi. That simply cannot be squared with ongoing sovereignty over the remaining 295,000 acres, which they now claim. Sure it can. I mean, one way to pursue that policy is to offer them lands in the west if they want to go there. That would certainly pursue the government's policy of removing them. This Court held in New York Indians that Article 13 of the treaty, which provides that the Oneidas agreed to remove, was sufficient to affect a present grant of the Kansas lands and to avoid any forfeiture. So it was much more than an agreement to agree or an offer, if you will. Well, you're saying there's no consideration if they simply agreed to remove if they, if they want to remove. No, they did yeah. receive, they did receive consideration yeah. and the Court made sure oh, that they that gave was, none I'm talking about. Uh, who gave none, Your Honor? The Indians. They uh, gave, you're, you're saying they gave no promise in exchange if they simply promised to remove if they felt like it. No, Your Honor, I'm saying that, that I'm trying to help you here. Uh, well, then in that case, I, I suppose I should agree. My, my okay. apology. But, but what, what they did was to agree to remove. And in fact, that's what happened. If you look at what transpired immediately following the treaty, by 1846, all but 350 acres, down from 5,000, have been sold by the Oneidas, and very few remain. By 1920, there are only 32 acres. And the U.S.'s activities in the area also confirmed that that was the understanding of the treaty that it terminated sovereignty. There are some very sparse references in the record to some exercise of jurisdiction by the U.S., starting around the turn of of the century, around the early 1900s. But those only relate to the 32 acres that remained occupied by the Oneidas. There is no indication of any exercise of U.S. jurisdiction 
over the remaining 295,000 acres. Well, per- perhaps the, the Treaty of Buffalo Creek is thinking of 50,000 acres where these particular uh, uh, Indian tribe members had their homes, or at least arguably. But just no one was thinking about the remaining 300,000 because they'd long left those. It had nothing to do with them. I believe the text and the historical background yeah. suggest otherwise, Your Honor. Article 4 of the treaty yeah. says that the Kansas lands will be the new homes of the Oneidas. And it also explains where the Oneidas can exercise sovereignty. It says that it will secure to the Oneidas in the Kansas lands, in said country, which refers to the Kansas lands, the right to establish their own form of government, to appoint their own officers, and to administer their own laws. That means that sovereignty is to be in Kansas, not to be in New York. Well, it it means that that's what was intended, but what do you make of all the testimony uh, about the representations made by, I forget the man's name, but the government representative, to the effect that you don't have to leave New That York. related only to the 5,000 acres that they occupied at that time. The record isn't very clear about why he made that assurance. No, but my, my, I guess it, it, let me just get to the point and then yes, you can answer sir. that. Doesn't that negate your argument that the treaty as such disestablished the reservation? No, Your Honor, it doesn't. The treaty on its terms appears to disestablish the reservation entirely. Gillette's statement could perhaps be read as a subsequent gloss on that treaty to assure the Indians that they won't be forced off of their land, the 5,000 acres that they continued to occupy, perhaps because since New York was not a party to the treaty, there couldn't be any explicit session language in the treaty. New York was the only entity that had a right to buy that remaining 5,000 acres because it held the right of preemption. So it may have been that the Oneidas wanted to ensure that they could reach reasonable terms. And they did. They sold almost all of that land within the following six years after proclamation of the treaty. So the contemporaneous history squares with that. It's very similar to what happened in in Santa Fe, in which this Court said there was a reservation that was created for the Santa Fe's. There was some indication of acceptance of that reservation, and that acceptance was sufficient to terminate the tribe's sovereignty over any lands outside of the reservation that was provided to them, even though many of them did not, in fact, remove to that land. Here, the Oneidas received much more. Not only did many of them sell the lands and leave immediately, but they received the benefit of their bargain by recovering compensation for the Kansas lands from this court in New York Indians. What is the precise language in, that you think relinquished, changed the sovereignty, that changed the sovereignty? I think there are several provisions, Your Honor. First of all, uh, in the recitals, uh, it states that the purpose of the treaty is to carry out the government's policy in removing the Indians from the east to the west of the Mississippi. Article 2 also notes that the Kansas lands will be a permanent home for all Indians now residing in the state of New York as well as elsewhere. And Article 4 states that there will be an exercise of sovereignty. It says specifically that they will be able to establish their own form of government, appoint their officers, and administer their laws in the Kansas land specifically. So I think those are the strongest provisions. I'd also like to touch uh, for a moment, if I can, on a question that several members of the Court have raised, which is what is the impact of this decision here? From the perspective of the State of, the, of New York and the localities, it's very serious because it does concern whether or not the tribe can unilaterally regain sovereignty over a very large tract of land in central New York. This is an area that has been well, — there are implications from Oneida II case that uh, the Indians can — reacquire land and assert some kind of possessory, right? With regard to a narrower swath of land than what is at issue here. And in any event, the Court expressly did not, did not, uh, pronounce on the effect of, of the Buffalo Creek Treaty here. If that's the case, what could well result is a, is a patchwork quilt of jurisdiction, which this Court has said poses tremendous governance problems. It's governance by tract book. This is not just hypothetical. There are already difficulties that have started to arise as a result of the Second Circuit's decision. For example, another tribe relying on the decision here purchased land within its original land claim area that's just 300 yards from a local high school and have begun operation of a gaming hall there. The locality attempted to enjoin operation of the gaming hall but was unable to do so in light of the Second Circuit's decision below. We anticipate that there will be many other problems of that sort that will arise. The residents of the area here have long settled and justifiable expectations. The settlement patterns are clear here. The absence of any exercise of U.S. jurisdiction outside a very small plot of land is not controverted. 
These are factors that this Court has repeatedly held in cases like Hagen and Yankton Sioux are relevant to the question of both what the contemporaneous <laughs> understanding of a treaty was and what the result should be today. And we submit that, that they should uh, lead to the same result here as well. There are no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Halligan. Uh, Mr. Smith, we'll hear from you, please. Justice Stevens, and may it please the Court, there was a suggestion in answer to an earlier question that the Oneidas have changed their position about whether the land is alienable when in their hands. Uh, that's not correct. There is nothing in the record to suggest that. What the record does suggest at page 213 of the Joint Appendix is that Cheryl has changed its position. It wanted an easement on Oneida land in 1997. Um, and at that page of the uh, appendix, you will see that Cheryl went to the Department of the Interior for federal approval of the easement under federal law, understanding at the time the Oneida's position and the federal law principle that the land wasn't subject even to an easement absent the Secretary's approval. The so you're saying your position was and is that it's not alienable without the approval of, uh, of the feds? Yes. And the land, when the uh, Oneida's possession of the land, actual possession is unified with their underlying federal property and treaty rights, the land is inalienable and cannot be sold today out of the Oneida possession any more than it could uh, 200 years ago. Oh, it is. A, it, it, the, the portion within the reservation you claim is alienable so long as it's not owned by an Oneida. The well, current owners can, can sell it to somebody else, right? Your Honor, the point of Oneida II yeah. is — the answer is yes. Yes, yes sir. The yes. answer is yes. The Frank, you is strange? No, Your Honor. The, it's, it, there is an unusual twist to it, and it arises from the fact that there were illegal transfers 200 years ago. The, uh, so there was a suggestion in the Oneida II decision, and it has been uh, followed by the uh, lower federal courts, that there may be equitable principles that constrain remedies in a chorus of order um, — uh, to be entered in a land claim action brought by a tribe that is out of possession. But the equitable principles that are at stake here are very different, um, and they don't involve the if, same. If you prevail in this case, then could um, suits be brought by the tribe to evict current owners of land on the historical Oneida 300,000-acre reservation? No, Justice O'Connor. The courts have ruled that we may not do that, and it is the position, and I will say it clearly here today, that the Oneidas do not assert a right <laughs> to evict landowners in the land claim area. Judge McKern, who But if it's, if it's owned by the State of New York, if it's been acquired somehow by the State, then what? We are not asserting a right to evict. We, we are not waiving any of the underlying rights that involve pos right to possession under federal law and aboriginal right, rights. And the point I'm making should not be construed that way. What I'm saying is that we are not asking a court and do not expect a court to evict anyone from action uh, from land that is not in our actual possession. What happens about, suppose, I, I just want to follow this. You don't evict the people who are there, but it's 22 square miles in the center of New York State. It's a lot of land, and maybe that's worth a trillion dollars. I don't know. So, so does that mean that the Indian tribe would have if, 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 would it mean that it had the right to, let's say, hundreds of billions of dollars, the value of that property, that it could sue someone for, the state of New York or the federal government, I guess the state of New York? Let me give you a concrete answer. The Cayuga land claim is approximately one quarter the size of the Oneida land claim, and it has gone to judgment and is on appeal in the uh, Second Circuit. The judgment in that case, after adjustments for interest and so on, was $250 million. And it was rendered against the state of New York only as the initial and continuous. And how, what was the acreage there? Uh, approximately one-fourth. The answer is 64,000 acres. Well, that may not be worth as much. Maybe this includes several cities and towns. What, what do you think it is? I mean, in other words, the answer to my question is, in principle, yes. In principle, if the Indian tribe owns 22 square miles, even if they can't get possession, they're entitled to the value of it, in your opinion. Correct. The point of Oneida, too, is that a damage, damages remedy is appropriate as to a tribe out of possession, but there's no suggestion that that is a judicial sale of the underlying federally protected tribe. No, no. Rights. Of course, the people who are there have it, but maybe it's not Buffalo. I don't know. Maybe it's all of Buffalo, New York, no, or maybe it's a, 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 a town that's uh, I'm not saying that that's the law, but I just wanted your view of that. And, and now I want to know this, that on the legal part, 
I would like your response to the uh, — I mean, take it, your answer is, yes, they're entitled to the value of it. That's, I'm right about that. Is that is your answer? Yes, Your Honor. Well, they're entitled to two items of value. They're entitled to uh, retrospective damages for trespass, and in that the Court has uh, not On seen the whole 300,000. Well, there is one part, part of it that we have not sued upon because there was a 1798 federal treaty that validated the transfer. The state, which feels that it was not bound by the Non-Intercourse Act, twice went to the federal government for formal federal, federal treaty approval of these transactions. One of them went through. That was 1798. The other one was 1802. The president did not proclaim it, and the state never went back to the federal government. Do the, would the Uniteds have a, a claim uh, to tax the current property owners? <clears throat> no, sir. Why not? Um, the decisions of the court in cases like Atkinson in Montana um, address the uh, lack of power of a tribe with respect to non-Indian fee lands within a reservation. Um, I recognize that there is an added wrinkle here in that the Oneida's rights persist in that land, even though it is out of their possession. And that wouldn't have been the same. That wouldn't have been true in Atkinson and Montana. But in that the courts have held that the possession of the non-Indians is lawful in the sense that it will not be interrupted and the land uh, title can be passed in subsequent transfers, uh, we accept the proposition that Montana and Atkinson would prevent the Oneida's from regulating in any respect, let alone taxing. Uh, any of the land in the possession of non-Indians. Mr. Smith, uh, isn't there any principle of latches that, that comes into effect here? I mean, really, what, what, you're, what you're asking the Court to do is to sanction a, a, a very odd checkerboard uh, system of jurisdiction in the middle of New York State. Some parcels, the ones that the Indians choose to buy and are able to buy, become Indian territory, and everything else uh, is governed by New York State. This is a, just a terrible situation as far as governance is concerned. And uh, part of the blame for the situation we're in is that the Oneidas did not complain about this for 170 years. The issue of latches and time is not within the questions presented in this case, notwithstanding that it's been identified in earlier decisions and was actually uh, raised by the counties in this court the last go-round. Latches does not bar this claim. Um, these were illegal transactions declared by federal statute to be of no validity in law or equity. Um, the Oneida II decision, which holds that background principles of federal law, which would ordinarily incorporate um, state statutes of limitation, don't apply because their intention with the underlying rule that only Congress can impair or extinguish this right. Those same back- but the, the case also held, you, you know, because of the passage of time and reliance interests that have developed, we are not going to give you possession. Now, why doesn't the same principle apply to giving you jurisdiction? Because of the passage of time, you can get damages for, for trespass. Maybe even you can get the value of the land. But it would just cre create a chaotic situation if we say that you, you have jurisdiction in the middle of New York State over any, any pieces of land that you can buy. The equitable principles that would inform remedy in an action brought by a tribe out of possession um, don't apply when the tribe is in possession or else there has been a judicial extinguishment of an underlying right that's only within the power of Congress to extinguish. Uh, the Court has been clear that the treaty right here, we have a federal treaty, and it says you have the free use and enjoyment of the land, and in New York Indians 1, the Court said that means similar, uh, the same promise made to the Senecas, uh, means that the land cannot be taxed. The uh, argument has been made that the Oneida's only rights are to be paid off now, to be, to in effect have the unextinguished federal aboriginal right and the unextinguished treaty right purchased. Those rights, through literally 200 years of decisions, are within the sole control of Congress. Oneida, too, made pains to say that this was an unusual situation uh, fraught with some tension and problems, but those problems were for Congress. There are uh, a dozen cases from this court in, that deal. In, Mr. Smith, in, first, would you clarify how much land is now claimed as Indian uh, within the tribe's Aboriginal right? It's 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 not well. One thing, clarify why you are not claiming the entire six million. Didn't they have six million acres to start with? 
They did. The um, matter was litigated in the Second Circuit and resolved adversely to the Oneidas. But I would, I would take the position that the Treaty of Canandaigua actually confirms the uh, transfer of land outside of the retained reservation so that the land we are talking about today as retaining uh, uh, the Oneidas' rights is, I think, approximately 270,000 acres. But some of that, you said, was taken out by an approved transfer, 1798. Yes, and that's why I'm not saying 300,000 acres. I can't do the arithmetic, and I don't have the final survey. But the some, land something claim around 275. Around 270. And the, the figure that the, the 250 million is for the rental, what is that, what is that for? In the Cayuga case, there were two elements of damages. One was retrospective, and that was um, rental damages for um, um, past trespass. The other was a current value because Judge McKern said that he would not evict anyone and that he thought a suitable alternative to eviction was the award of value because it would put the tribe in a position through a free market and voluntary relationship with purchasers to, quote, restore its homeland. Judge McKern got really to the heart of this process by recognizing that there are inequities all around, if you will, and that the court is without the power to extinguish the underlying rights. It's Congress's role, but there needs to be a sensible way of recognizing um, those rights today. And what Judge McKern decided is that damages would put the tribe in a position to do what the Oneidas have done with respect to the land that's at issue here before the court, and that's to make, um, you know, a fair and square deal and pay full value. Which New York State paid. And that's, that's the end of it. Yes, Your Honor. If I understand your question, the answer is yes. It's not the end of it. I, from what you're saying, I gather that, that you believe in that case, once they purchase the land, it becomes tribal. Correct. I mean, that's the end of that litigation. There is a judgment. It's gone to the Court of Appeals, and it's there now. The issue of damages remedies when the tribe is out of possession is simply conceptually and fundamentally different than the question of what happens when the tribe has joined um, possession. What, with what do you say on right? the merits, then, to the, the claim that, look, there were 300,000 of these acres at the 1838 or when the Treaty of Buffalo, Buffalo Creek. There were 300,000 acres that nobody was paying any attention to because there were no tribe members that lived there. So that when you have language in the treaty under those circumstances that says their home is now, where was it, Illinois or uh, the, the Kansas. Their home is now Kansas. That's the nation. That's the place. And uh, that, that you heard the, the language cited. And even though a person says, you can live here as long as you want, that just means they can live there as long as they want. That doesn't mean it's the reservation. The reservation and sovereignty may have gone to Kansas, though, of course, nobody had to move unless he struck a fair bargain that he agreed to with the state of New York. I take it that's their argument. I just want to hear your response. There are a lot of parts to that. Let me respond to what I think is the most fundamental. Yeah. That argument rests on the idea that there was an assumption mm -hmm. at the time of the Treaty of Buffalo mm -hmm. Creek that the prior transfers were valid. It's an argument of ratification by assumption. Oneida II says, in a much more forceful circumstance, that even a later federal treaty that explicitly refers to the prior session does not ratify it because the ratifying language has to be clear and express, and you have to believe that both the Indians and the Congress, the United States, meant to do that. H here, the, 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 if you think about it in what I just heard uh, concerning Buffalo Creek, there, there's a, an interesting asymmetry. We're supposed to assume that the treaty covered all of the land, but we're not supposed to conclude that Ransom Gillette's promise has covered it all. Uh, we're supposed to believe that one, by assumption, mm -hmm. extends to the uh, entire reservation and that the other forceful promises of a federal treaty commissioner that you need not go anywhere are actually very limited and carried with them a thought that they were extinguishing rights in other land. That interaction with Ransom Gillette is crucial. The treaty does well, not — It would be odd to, have a, to give assurance that you could buy back what you've lost. That, 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 that's a very strange construction of the representations attendant upon Buffalo Creek. I understand what you're talking about with the 5,000 acres. The representations from the Federal Treaty Commissioner were not that they could buy it back. The Federal Treaty Commissioner went to the Oneidas because they would not agree to the treaty. They didn't want to give up their rights. He gave them a piece of paper that was meant to assure them that they were not giving up their rights. 
There was no suggestion in this important interaction that they were bargaining over the loss of other rights. Mill Lacks is directly in point here. Mill Lacks, I think, or from Mill Lacks, you can derive the proposition that where the record shows no bargaining over a right and where the treaty does not refer to the right, the Indians will not be yelled to, held to have silently yielded their important rights. In the nature of this interaction, you have um, the suggestion that you have a far more important right and much larger part of the reservation that persisted as a matter of federal law. There's nothing about what happened at Buffalo Creek that would suggest that anyone would think they were affecting the Oneida's rights and lands that were not involved in the treaty. Now, Mr. the treaty — Mr. Stewart, I'm, your, your time is, is beginning to come up, and there is one thing we haven't talked about that I'd really like to get your view on, and that is the, the 1788 treaty. What was that? Fort Schuyler? Treaty of Fort Schuyler? Yes. Between New York State and the Oneidas. Now, that contained language which said the Oneidas cede and grant all their lands to the people of the state of New York. That, that was the, the operative provision. Later on, it, it, Article 2 says, of the ceded lands, the ceded lands, lands that have been ceded, a tract described by meets and bounds is reserved to the Oneidas to hold to themselves in their posterity forever. Now, I would normally interpret that to mean that the Oneidas gave up all of their sovereignty over the lands and were given back by the State of New York the right over this tract designated by meets and bounds. Now, I'm saying I would normally interpret that except in a treaty with the Indians. In a treaty with the Indians, you say, well, and we have cases which, which have language somewhat like this, and they say, well, they really didn't cede the part that they reserved. That may be the case in, in ordinarily, but it, it seems to me a, a, a basic principle of, of, of contract law, of treaty law, of any law, that where there is an ambiguous phrase or provision, you interpret it the way the parties themselves have interpreted it. And it seems to me that the subsequent history after 1788 indicates that the Oneidas believed that New York State had jurisdiction over that land. Uh, the New York State police were in there. The, the New York State managed the lands. Justice Scalia, actually it's interesting in the joint appendix in the Court of Appeals at page 413 is the actual document that governed the transfer of this land, a state statute. And in that statute, the state granted its right of preemption to an individual to acquire the land, because it understood that it had not yet exercised its right of preemption. That's, in the conduct of the parties, a direct uh, refutation of the idea that the right of preemption was exercised in the Treaty of Buffalo, in the Treaty of Fort Schuyler, the 1788 Treaty. The most fundamental point, though, about the 1788 Treaty is that next came the 1794 Treaty of Canandaigua, which embodied a federal promise to protect the free use and enjoyment of this land and the Oneida's possession of it. And that exact promise, not sort of like, but exact, was held in New York Indians one to prevent taxation of the Seneca's land. Now, I guess I'd like to make two quick points before uh, I'm out of time. Uh, one is that with respect to the idea that it's just too late, um, apart from the fact that the question is not presented, I want to emphasize that in Section 2415 of Title 28, Congress explicitly um, focused on the question of these old claims. And if you read the legislative history, all they talked about was how to deal with the Oneida claim and these old claims. And they not only uh, provided the title claims are not barred by statute of limitations and established a limitations period that would not have run against the Oneidas because they're on a federal list, but they did the following, which I think is notable. The statute provides that these claims accrued in 1966 on the date of the statute. There's no room for background uh, equitable principles in federal law where Congress has specifically focused on a problem, addressed it. The idea is, I suppose, that there's no room to fill gaps here by the Court where Congress has decided just what the gaps are and how to fill them. The, the other point that I would make uh, concerns the Treaty of Buffalo Creek. The Treaty's language leaves it to both sides to decide whether or not Indians are going to Kansas. The, legislate, the history of the Treaty shows that the United States backed away from any language which would oblige it to remove Indians, and the language with respect to the Indians left them a choice. But ultimately, all of that is controlled by what happened. The federal government made a decision that no Indians would go to Kansas. The idea that Buffalo Creek extinguished reservations in New York 
would seem bizarre to anyone in New York today because the Onondagas have reservations, the Senecas have reservations, the St. Regis have reservations, the Tonawandas have reservations, the Tuscaroras have reservations, and the Oneidas have reservations. It didn't extinguish just the — there's an idea that you can look at this in a vacuum. It didn't just extinguish the Oneida reservations. Under the Santa Fe rationale, the point is not that Congress — ultimately intended two reservations, although it has done that often, the Choctaw, the Mississippi Choctaw, the Seminoles, it frequently happened with removal that there were more than one reservation. But here you would have to believe that Congress intended no reservation. You would have to believe that Congress quickly came to the decision that none of these Indian tribes in New York actually had a reservation anywhere, um, and uh, that's not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Stewart. Uh, Justice Stevens, and may it please the Court. I'd like to address first the City's argument that the long passage of time renders it improper to give the tribe a tax exemption on lands that it recently repurchased. And that, that argument is wrong for three reasons. First, if we are correct that the tribe had federally protected title as of the 1790s, and that that federal protection was never validly extinguished, then the fact that the tribe was out of possession of the relevant lands for nearly two centuries is itself a distinct and substantial legal wrong. And it would be adding insult to injury to say that precisely because the tribe had suffered that initial injury, it should be disentitled to take advantage of the tax exemption that would otherwise flow from its possession of I don't really understand that argument at all. I mean — it, 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 it's just a general rule that where you've been wrong, you have to come forward in a timely fashion to get the wrong righted. And what difference does it make what the nature of the wrong is, whether it's dispossession or not? Well, I think, it, I think it's important to distinguish between two different types of delay. What was at issue in Oneida 1 and Oneida 2 was delay in bringing the underlying lawsuit. And even in that context, the Court said that the suit was not barred entirely, but equitable factors might be taken into account in formulating an appropriate remedy. Here we don't have delay in filing a lawsuit. That is, nobody doubts that the tribes asserted their right to a tax exemption promptly after repurchasing the relevant lands. The argument on the other side is that their delay in purchasing the lands should be analogized well, to a Well, do you say that a tribe can never uh, lose its sovereign rights to land? Can it acquiesce in the loss of those rights? This Court has held that the tribe, that a tribe may abandon aboriginal title to land. Yes, and we have held that a state can abandon sovereignty, as in Massachusetts versus New York. But the Court has also held that once Congress creates a reservation, once it confers explicit federal protection on particular lands, the reservation can be diminished or disestablished only by act of Congress. It, it can't be terminated through adverse possession. And with respect to the question whether delay in buying the land should be analogized to delay in bringing well, a law. that might give them a right to some kind of damages for a violation. But what does that do to the sovereign claims of the tribe? I think the, the reservation would remain a reservation. As Mr. Smith pointed out, with respect to parcels within the reservation that are not owned by Indians, mm -hmm. the tribe's regulatory authority is extremely limited. And therefore, the tribe would not be able to exercise anything like plenary regulatory jurisdiction over the whole 270,000 acres. What is it? You said extremely limited. Uh, this was the first that I heard that the tribe might have some authority over part of that, what's the 275,000 acres, even though it hadn't repurchased the past. The court in Atkinson trading and in uh, Montana versus United States before that had said that the tribe may be able to regulate conduct on non-Indian lands to the extent that the conduct involves voluntary transactions with the tribe or its members or to the extent that the regulation is necessary in order to protect the tribe's sovereignty over the land that it possesses. As but now we're talking about land that there, where there are no tribe members, as I understand it in this area, is predominantly non-tribal Members. I agree. And certainly, and Atkinson Trading makes clear that even when the great bulk of the land is owned by the tribe or its members, the tribe's ability to regulate conduct on the non-Indian parcels is sharply limited. That, that would be doubly true in a, a tract of this nature. But, but to return to the point about 
the state's reliance interest, I think it's imp- or the city's reliance interest, I think it's important to stress that this case is only about taxation, and a municipality can't claim to have the same sort of reliance interest in being able to tax that a potential defendant well, in a law. That may be true, but that's why I wondered about the damage part of it. That is, I'm still thinking that a trespass action for trespasses that occurred in 1850 or 1700 is worth millions today, even if it's tiny because of the interest, passage of time, etc. And you add that to the value of the land, I'm thinking of numbers that are astronomical. And yet, that hasn't happened. And so what actually, as a pra- and I, that's why I'm thinking isn't a damage action far more serious than simply taking property off the tax rolls. That, that certainly — And, 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 and I, that's why I want to know how in practice this works out. Does Congress have the power, for example, to deal with it? Is what we're considering in this case simply a negotiating position and strengthening people's hands vis-a-vis legislation? What's going on? Con- Congress does have the power to deal with it. And at the end of the Court's opinion in Oneida II, the Court expressed — confidence that up to this point has, has not been borne out, that Congress would fix the problem yeah, by — Congress has done nothing about this, has it? The, Can — has the tribe asked administratively for um, — the Bureau of Indian Affairs to recognize it now as a tribe? Well, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has recognized the tribe all along. That is, under the Treaty of Canandaigua, uh, the federal government was required to pay annuities and, and treaty cloth to the Six Nations, and the, the federal government has done that continuously since the beginning. So we've always recognized this to, to be a tribe. I, I mean, I think you you put your finger on an important point, Justice Breyer, in that the Court in Oneida II con- said that it hoped that Congress would fix the problem and thought that it would, but said even if Congress doesn't legislate a solution, the suit can go forward. The Court contemplated that equitable considerations could be taken into account in formulating a remedy, but it certainly didn't contemplate that the tribe at the end of the day would be left without any remedy at all. And as, as you point out, if the tribe can sue for damages, it seems far-fetched to think that it wouldn't be able to reassert the tax immunity that what follows. Tax, what taxes are we talking about? In addition to property tax, are we also talking about sales tax? No. The Court has said, as a, the court has said as a general matter, as a matter of federal law, a tribal merchant on tribal land can be required to collect sales taxes from non-Indians, at least for the purchase of goods that were manufactured off the reservation. But it yeah. isn't just taxes we're talking about. It's jurisdiction over these parcels of land. It, I mean, taxes, that's just one aspect of saying that this land no longer belongs to New York State. I mean, ta- taxes are at issue, are the only thing that's at issue in this case. But I, I, I agree that holding this parcel to be a reservation would have implications for regulatory jurisdiction as well. Now, there isn't a categorical rule of federal law that says that states and localities absolutely cannot regulate conduct on tribal lands within the reservation. Whether there's a preemption test, there's certainly a thumb on the scale in favor of an exemption from state and local uh, regulation where tribal reservation lands are involved. Mr. Stewart, I have one question about Buffalo Creek. If we hold that Buffalo Creek didn't disestablish the reservation, then doesn't uh, the New York Indian case rest on a false premise because that case gave $2 million for the failure to give the Kansas land? Well, the court in, in the New York Indians, too, recognized to start with that the treaty affected an immediate session of the Oneida's Wisconsin lands to the federal government. And the Court specifically noted that that session in and of itself would be sufficient consideration to support a contract between private parties. So it it simply isn't correct to say that the New York Oneidas gave up nothing other than a promise to remove. Uh, The second — Was there any positive indication — I just don't remember this — in in the New York case that they would — that they, in fact, uh, had ceded anything of New York — of their interests in New York? as distinct from the Wisconsin land. I mean, there were references to the primary inducement to the federal government's entering into the treaty being the desire to That's, remove. that's entering into the treaty. But when it came to compensation, was there an indication that they were being compensated for anything other than Kansas land, which they had obtained as a result of ceding their Wisconsin land? No. No. Okay. The, the compensation was strictly for the Kansas lands that were denied to them. And it's important to note that the Seneca's — But, but there, there was no indication that they got Kansas — for anything other than Wisconsin. Is that correct? They got — I mean, they didn't — they weren't 
held to have promised, made, made a commitment to remove from New York. Now, clearly, in analyzing the reason — But there was no indication that they had ceded anything with respect to title in New York, was that, there? That's correct. Okay. Well, did it rest it upon the, the session in Wisconsin? It rested in part upon the session in Wisconsin. It rested in part on a fairly technical argument to the effect that the grant of Kansas lands was one in presente. That is, it was a present grant of Kansas lands, and therefore the New York Indians could be disentitled to those lands only if they had, a forfeiture had been established. And the Court looked to Article Three of the Treaty to determine the conditions for forfeiture. It said that the Federal Government would have been required to allege a forfeiture by legislative or judicial act, et cetera. The, the, the other thing I really wanted to — the point I wanted to make about the, the reliance interests of the taxing jurisdiction are that no matter how long a particular tract has been taxable, it is all — may I finish this? It is always within the realm of — a city's contemplation that it may be bought up tomorrow by the federal government, a church, any other tax-exempt entity, and consequently the municipality can have no sense of repose that it will remain taxable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. The case is submitted.